In our conversational safari so far tonight, we've touched on politics, social parties, business affairs, sports, and scads of other subjects. And now, mes enfants, can you tell me what is the pattern that runs through all of them? They all have to do with money, Betty? No, Larry. They all have to do with promoting something. Mm -hmm. Exhibition, usually with a dash of glamour, a pinch of suspense. Everything is built around an image these days, whether it's a package of soap powder or a presidential candidate. Right on the button, Bob. Here, tonight, at this party, most of us are playing a part. Tomorrow morning at the office, in conference and during the coffee break, and at lunch, we will assume different roles, but we're always acting. We're trying to communicate an impression, a message, a personality or a sales pitch. We're seeking to call attention to ourselves. We're all in theater, large or small. Wasn't it Shakespeare who described it best? Life is a stage and we are but the actors. Yes, Larry, only his actual words were, all the world's a stage and all the men and women merely players. Oh. Don't feel badly, Larry. I never could remember lines either. Well, I've always felt that the most interesting aspects of the theater are the people off stage. The audience, the stage doorman, the press agents. There's also the inevitable couple that always manages to get two tickets for front row center, where the lady preems and fawns and the man with his affable snores is an inspiration to performers. Yes, and don't forget the persistent first-nighters, the distinguished Indian couple. He and his turban, dark, inscrutable, mysterious, almost sinister looking. Is he of royal blood? Is he a delegate to the United Nations? No, he simply owns an automobile spare parts business in Bombay. <laughs> yes, and while his wife's talking in perfect English during intermission with a couple from Bronxville, he's estimating the blonde usher, trying to figure out whether she's a size 10 or a 12. <laughs> then there's the fellow in the back row. He laughs and laughs all through the whole play, even when the comedy is not so devastating. Why? Because he has $50,000 invested in the show. Ah, but you have omitted the suave young man with the small goatee. So natty, so fashionable. His relaxed manner tells you who he is. He's the hairdresser for the angel's <laughs> wife. But where are the producer, director, and composer? They are where all producers, directors, and composers should be on opening night, huddled in a corner of the bar across the street. And then the curtain goes up again, this time on act two, and we witness a lot of razzle-dazzle choreography staged by a lad borrowed from a commercial producer. He's best known for that ubiquitous face tissue commercial on TV in which his dance routine sold a billion boxes of pop-up tissue. Yes, and then after all the billboards, all the hoopla, all the money, the costumes, the scenery, too often the show is a flop. But there's one writer who rarely misses, that Shakespeare. He goes on and on like old man River. So true. He is the most remarkable storyteller the stage has ever known. Homer wrote of adventure and war. Tolstoy pictured tragedies and people in trouble. Mark Twain told comic stories. Dickens excelled in melodramatic tales. Plutarch wrote histories and Hans Christian Andersen spun fairy tales. But William Shakespeare was master of all of these at one and the same time. He is the true immortal of the stage. Do you know his secret? He never stops to explain things. He simply puts his people on stage without explanations, and as they move about and start talking, they begin to explain themselves. Even the scenery is left largely to the imagination of the playgoers. His Antony and Cleopatra, for example, covers about 12 years and ranges over the whole of the ancient world from Egypt to Rome. There are 42 changes of scene in this play, but Shakespeare's creative skill stimulates the audience to imagine the Roman galley and Cleopatra's palace and many other scenes, in spite of the sparse scenery. George Bernard Shaw took quite a different approach. He lectured his audience on stage and off. But his St. Joan and many of his other plays are masterpieces nevertheless. Many of the Shavian prefaces are longer than the plays. He was an extremely opinionated, egotistical, but lovable genius. I saw that Theatre Guild production of his St. Joan some time ago. And that reminds me of the anecdote they tell of George Bernard Shaw. It seems the Guild was about to stage one of his productions at a time when he was still living. The Guild thought it was desirable to change a few lines in one little scene, and they cabled Shaw for permission. The great man imperiously shot back a cable. No changes, not by so little as a semicolon. Hooray for him. He had integrity. He never cared what the critics said, either. The critics often are wrong. Remember A.B.'s Irish Rose? The critics panned it almost to a man. Yes, and it ran for years, I think five and a half years, 
over 2,000 performances. Mm, and since we're looking backward, why don't we have any more Ziegfeld Follies or George White scandals with lovely girls? Well, if you've seen the girls in their delightful bikinis on the beaches in recent years... Have I? That's your answer. Why buy tickets? Oh, I wish I had a million dollars. Why, Betty? I like money, Bob. What would you do with it? Well, first, I'd buy some pretty clothes. But you look wonderful tonight in that white chiffon and Alice blue sash. Thank you, but I can't wear this downtown next Monday. Uh, maybe not. But you would brighten any office with it. What else would you do with your million? Well, I'd adopt a little Korean waif. That's laudable. What else? I'd buy a 60-foot yacht and make Bob my captain with a smart white hat with gold scrambled eggs on the peak. Hmm. May I be your first mate, Betty? Of course, Larry. My nautical mate. But not naughty, I pray. And we three would go sailing over the bounding vein. Where would we sail to? To Treasure Island. But you'd have enough money. You wouldn't need more treasure. Oh, a girl always wants more, Bob. More clothes, more diamonds, more yachts. Why, you little gold digger. <laughs> of course I'm a gold digger. You didn't think I was a clam digger, did you? No, but I was hoping you were a bookworm. Wouldn't I look pretty as a bookworm? No clothes on. Wriggling my way through the books in your library, no doubt. I'd love that. You mean you'd come from work, sit down in your den, Take down the book on how to live alone and like it. Open it to the chapter on Beware of Gold Diggers. And there you'd find me, wriggling along the page in my little birthday suit, my hair in a frightful mess. I repeat, I'd love it. Be my bookworm. You know, to tell the truth, at college, the boys on the campus voted me the girl they would like most to curl up with while mm. reading in front mm. of the fireplace. I was mortified. I always wanted to be a femme fatale. And there, these college boys were typing me as a bookworm. Smart boys they were. You must have been very popular. Oh, I don't like this subject anymore. Let's get back aboard my golden yacht. After we leave Treasure Island, we would sail for Capri, the blue grottoes of Capri, then up the coast of Italy to Monaco to pay a little visit to the prince and his American princess, and to drop a few thousand pounds on the green baize tables at Monte Carlo. Oh, to be wealthy. Well, money does come in handy for yachts. A can of baked beans now and then when you're hungry. And for keeping your shelf filled with toothpaste, nylons, Gershwin records, safety pins, and bank books. And headache powders, Larry. Keep some on your shelf. Wealth brings headaches. I don't agree with you, Bob. It's been proved that just as many poor people have headaches as rich people. And the headaches aren't much different. All you need to know in order to get rich, Bob, is contained in that book, How to Succeed in Business Without Really Trying. It tells you how to get a raise from your boss, how to grab credit, how to be an expert apple polisher. And especially how to stab the right back. In other words, you have to be a Machiavelli. Right. No, seriously. There are a great many Americans who've made their million in recent years by a combination of luck. That's recognizing an opportunity and being prepared to seize it when it offers itself, plus ideas, ambition, and good American horse sense. You're right, Betty. I knew of a fellow, Finn Hocken Magnus, who came to America from Norway and made a million in music with a little idea. He knew harmonicas, but they were handmade, imported, and expensive. He decided to make them out of plastic, similar to buttons. He experimented and then bravely spent his meager life savings on molds and machinery. Plastic engineers, musical professors, they laughed at him, but he kept on working. He hunted for a plastic that would give a musical sound. Finally, he hit on a pinging polystyrene. It took months to get the reeds in tune in his original models, but he did it. And finally, he had developed a plastic harmonica with only five parts that could be turned out by a machine in 15 seconds. He became very wealthy. America has hundreds of similar stories. Our wealth has come from men with ingenuity and perseverance such as this man displayed. And they had no more headaches than the average person. The interesting point is that the average American does not prize his possessions much unless he has worked for them. That's why we don't find the bridal dowry present in our marriages. It's a good thing, Bob. Otherwise, nobody would have me. I have only my paltry brains and my cosmetic counter beauty to offer. But I can cook. Hmm. You're lucky you're in America where those things count. Especially when wrapped so enticingly in a lovely package like you. Mm. But in France and Germany, you'd really be in trouble, Betty. There the man looks on a wealthy marriage as one of the most reliable means of getting an assured income. Many of them demand a handsome dowry. Ah, oh, money. 